So the, the version that I wrote up to scrape my own sort of uh, set of files relied on this uh, OS walk. So it just like traverses your entire directory and finds everything. And then I find files that ends with this extension. So it's like a, a, a cute trick that we'll see later, because there's a complement to that called starts with. That is one of the methods you could have used to solve the homework. So I go through and I list all the files that I got back, which are all IPYMB files, quite a bit of them. <laughs> and then, so there were kind of two major ways to, to, to solve the, the file format issue. One was to recognize that the contents are JSON. And you could have deduced that by either opening your IPYMB files with a notepad editor and just like see that, yeah, that looks like JSON. Or if you look at the official Jupyter Notebook documentation, it says we're using JSON. So that's two ways to figure that out. If you treated it as JSON, that means you could take advantage of the structure of the, of the files. Alternatively, some people decided to treat it as just a flat text file. Totally also acceptable, right? That totally works. It just means that the thing that you're parsing for will have to be slightly different because it's not taking advantage of the structure in JSON. All right, so I'm dumping off one file here. And basically, the, the top level sort of key is cells. And then there's an open square bracket, which means there's a list that follows. And if you think about it, that makes sense. Our notebook is composed as a set of cells that are in sequential order. So this list contains a set of dictionaries, where each dictionary is the cell. So, that, so everything so far is here pretty straightforward. It means, though, that you have a set of nested lists and dictionaries. So the trick there is if you're taking advantage of the JSON structure, you have to figure out what is the content structure that I'm going to find the code, right? Because the code is a specific, um, so there's a cells <laughs> list. And then there's a dictionary, and the cell type on that first one is a markdown. Right? So I, I changed the type to markdown, and then I wrote some text in there. This next one here has code, and then confusingly outputs. But uh, I think the, yeah, here we go. So even though the cell type is code, outputs comes first, because its order doesn't matter too much. But then source, that's the part where we care about. Right? So you have to break down this JSON structure into the appropriate sort of thing that you're looking for, which was a specific cell in that list with type source. And you have to figure out the content there. So like, this is our first thing we're actually looking for. We had to get past all this other good stuff. All right. So, so th if you scrolled through the more of the file here, you see some weird stuff like this. This is just a PNG file encoded as text so that you can save it in your plain text HTML file. But that gets rendered as a picture in this notebook. That causes this file to be very big. So I don't And then, all right. So the, the smart way to break this down, this is what I recommend, is to say, like, I've got my JSON. I load it into a variable called data. And then um, I can look at the cells. And what, what type is it? Well, that's a list. OK, if it's a list, what's the length of the list? Right, and I just iteratively sort of break down um, going deeper and deeper into the JSON structure. So once I know that it's a, a list that has length 54, let's look at what the contents of the zeroth element of that list are. All right, and that's where we saw the markdown. And the next one is the code. And here we can see that the cell type is markdown for the zeroth cell. So we're going to have to figure out what does it look like if we have a cell type code, right? And then we can print all the code from the cells. So that's the fun part. And what that gets you back is a list um, of all the lines in every cell that has code. So again, this is the part we care about. So we're going to have to figure out, now that we've got that list of strings, how to extract the, the import statements out. All right. So this is where I was warning you about that starts with. This was one of, I think, three methods that I saw used. So it starts with is on that line. It's a string. And so then we just print that. And we can do that. This is the, the way I operate. I just sort of like write it for one notebook. And then I say, OK, this works. Now I'm going to put, I'm going to embed that inside of a nested loop over all the files. Right? And, and what I get back from that is this large list, what we call all imported from. 
where we have pinned everything that we find. And then I, uh, who here is comfortable with using the set command? Everybody's happy. No? Set. So we take a list, and the list may have like the element A and B and C and A and D, right? And we want the unique things back from that list. And so if you change a list, which is this all imported from, that's every single line, but there may be some repetitions in there, right? Like I called pandas a bunch of times. And so I only want one of those, and so I'll use the set command to bring that to just the unique elements in the list, and then I'll convert it back to a list. So that's what this is doing. List, set of that list. So I'm getting back the unique elements. Let's see. Um, let's see. Right, so then I was, I was cleaning that up a little bit basically to, so I grabbed all the lines that start with importer from, and then I wanted to clean up so I could just get a unique list of all the things come back, and, and that's my list. So in the end, this is what I was aiming for, and I'm going to gather all these across all of your outputs and, and be happy. So that's quite a few things over one semester. So you should say, like, if you've used this many things and you sort of have gained familiarity, good job. So that's how I did it. There were some other examples that I saw. Um, some were, so the one that I, I'm not going to show you here, I think maybe I, I don't know if I have it pulled up or not. Yeah, I'm not, I don't think I found an example of it here while I was waiting. But another way to solve this is if you're looking for the sort of plain text structure and you're ignoring the fact that it's JSON, you could just look for lines that contain the string import. Right, from, from your IPMIB file, and then see if that is commented out or part of a markdown. But for most part, those import lines and any plain text is going to be the one that you care about. From was a little bit harder, but still doable. And then the third method is to use regular expressions. Let's see. That starts with. So here, someone wrote a very complicated version of the mm -hmm. regular expression to find. Strings that contain import and a white space, and then from with a, a white space. Yeah, or lines that have a space and then import. So they gathered all those different um, IP. Yeah. Actually, that syntax is quite useful. It doesn't get import and from, it gets whatever in between. The things. Well, you're looking. You're gonna, and from, yes, it's yeah. the same. So he, is this yours? Yeah. So, yeah. so you're using groups there. Yeah. yeah. All right. So yeah. in the end, let's see where we got back. So this was a, a fancy one because it counted all the uh, the instances on a, on a bar graph. You're going all out there. <laughs> all right. So I think that's all I have to say in the homework. So there's. You could either treat the file as JSON or not, and then once you have the file contents loaded, you could either use starts with, or you could just treat it as a string and scripts for the word import, or you could use regular expressions. All those work. So at the end of class, so that's the end of the homework. Any questions there? So I'm going to, uh, at the end of class, give everyone time, because I'm supposed to give time for the survey. I think three people have completed it, and it's a required survey. So I have to give you time in class to do this survey. Um, have you guys seen the email on this? Anyone have questions on that? It's totally unfamiliar to you. <laughs> okay, I'm going to give you time, and you need to do it. So that's all the enforcement I can really do on my part. I have to actually be out of the room while it occurs. So I will leave the room and be in the hallway while you're doing it. Does that make sense? Hmm? Nice <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm just following the rules, man. <laughs> All right. Before this class, I sent out, uh, I think, a few. I hope I did. There were some some ethics sort of uh, uh, podcast that was pretty good. Um, but we're going to cover a little bit of ethics and legality issues today. And then towards the end of class, we'll have two people present their projects. So this is sort of a preview of what you'll be experiencing December 13th, next Thursday, uh, when everybody does, when everybody minus two does that. Okay. Oh. <laughs>
there's a lot of things I'm not going to talk about. So hopefully the things that you talk about tonight are useful. That's my, my primary goal. So the I'm, I would consider myself relatively introspective. And so like I find it natural to consider my own values and like how I behave and act. That is not everyone's norm. Right? Not everybody sits there and contemplates their existence. So if that's not your routine, welcome to this class. For everyone else who is comfortable doing that, this will feel kind of natural. The reason it's important to sort of have an open discussion about this is because not everybody agrees with you. So you're going to have to navigate that. Because if you don't, it's going to cause stress and tension and defeat your ability to actually do data science. So even though you might say, like, why are we having to learn ethics for data science? Well, it's going to cause you trouble if you don't. And you have to know not only how to engage with someone else, but like you're not going to be able to come to an agreement with everyone. Right? You can't come to consensus. Someone's going to disagree with you, and you're going to have to navigate through that, either like not do the work or figure out um, some sort of compromise. Like It just won't work all the time. So that can end relationships. Has anyone here had that sort of conflict in their practice? I'm assuming not. All right. So usually when you're, the reason I think for that is because when you're in a workplace and you've all signed up to do the work, like you've interviewed, you've been accepted to that position, you sort of had some conception of what kind of work that's going to be. Right? And so if you know that ahead of time, you've already bought off on the idea that it's a good thing to do and it's morally acceptable. Right? It's less common that you'll sign up for work and then run into some moral hazard that you do not foresee. But that could happen, right? Like if, <laughs> not that I've done that, but if, if you work in a work environment where the projects are sort of dynamic and they're not known in advance, and you have to make a choice of like, is the business going to do this work? Or are we signing up for this? That's a case where you have to evaluate, does it make sense to do it business-wise, but also can we get away with it legally? And is it morally acceptable from my own standards, right? So like when you're coming on to do projects all the time, especially in a small company, like there's a desire to do something. So an example of my, my friend, um, he was like a freelancer for, for coding websites. And so a lot of the job offers he got was to scrape websites. Like those were offers that would come in. And they were morally ambiguous. And sometimes they explicitly said, like, you can ignore you know, the, the rules governing this website. We think it's OK to do. And like, <laughs> that's, that can get kind of sketchy because like, Who's going to get in trouble? The guy scraping the website, right? Not the people paying him. So that can be a, both a business decision and a moral eth ethical issue. All right. So this is a, a paper exercise, or you can use your computer. But the, you're going to set a baseline for yourself. Right? So we are eventually going to have multi-person discussions in the in the class tonight. And so before we do that. We're going to write down what our baseline experience is. Does anyone need a pen? <coughs> so I just find this sort of useful because if you just sort of walk into a group discussion, and you, you're sort of susceptible to group things. Right? And so this is a way of setting your individual baseline before you talk with other people. Anybody else need paper? No? Okay. Keep walking around. I'm going to give you 7.35 on the big clock.
And I see about half your pens moving, so we'll give it a little bit more time to finish up. If anyone is feeling bold, would you like to contribute what you wrote down? And it's not a requirement, just I don't want to throw anything out there. Jared? Uh, for initial emotional response, I put confusion, uh, just because more often than not, I see these things in black and white. Okay. Um, You're confused about why someone else disagrees with you? Well, if it's an ethical thing, again, I think it's black and white more often than not. So if somebody's on that other side of it, I'm like, I was wrong. Um, my initial intellectual response is to ask for clarification or more information to try and understand if maybe I understood something wrong um, before I start completely pointing fingers and then try to understand if there is some logic behind what this person has said or, or what this action was. Um, the point at which I feel like I engage is if they double down on something I feel like is wrong mm -hmm. and try to explain why it's that way and then typically i'll only defer if i feel like the person's just wrong and not causing harm maybe well if they're causing harm i'll stop that but uh, yeah. if it's just like a irrational thing at some point i just wipe my hands when you say to this person it's not mm -hmm. okay. yeah that's all I'm doing. anyone else <clears throat> My initial emotional response is fear because I know like whatever decision I make, there's going to be something unpleasant about it. So it's like, that's why I would have that response. Um, and then my intellectual response is, okay, if I do this, it could affect my opportunities in the future. Um, you know, I might not get future jobs or this could affect my reputation, um, things like that. Um, but if I don't do it, it's going to affect my job now and could create a bunch of interpersonal problems. And I guess, you know, it's kind of hard to decide when to engage versus defer. Um, but I guess, you know, really simplifying it, it's probably when the pros outweigh the cons. But, you know, that encompasses a lot of things, including like how serious like the moral or ethical issue is. There's a lot to, to dissect there. Yeah. yeah. Cool. And I just want to add to the last point okay. um, in terms of when you engage and defer, I think, in Depending on systems you are in, um, a lot depends on your role in your relationship Absolutely. with that person. Because if you're higher up a supervisor, there's a different type of approach than it is from your peers. Mm -hmm. So I think I would engage if I notice that, you know, from the standpoint of a supervisor. And it's probably something that you just uh, sit down with that person and talk to them, you know, just describe to them the issue and then and why it's not okay, and, and then you observe uh, how they respond to it. And either there's going to be some remedial actions after that, or if that happens again, then it's a whole different story. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but like the history matters, and your the role, not everybody's yeah. equal there, right? Like that was one of your points, is like the roles matter of the people involved. Right, yeah, the roles matter. So if you're a peer, then you talk to a supervisor. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? I'm going to have a different reaction. Okay, thank you. Those are all very good points, I think. <laughs> this is a really messy matter, so like me covering it in an hour does zero justice, but it almost feel more negligent to not do it. So that's why. All right, so there is an actual course that covers this more broadly for a semester. Um, and it's not offered, uh, it wasn't offered this semester, so. I wasn't able to coordinate with the instructor on the content because there wasn't one. I did manage to speak with um, uh, another person who was in engineering management. 
So they have added to their syllabus a uh, section for data science specifically. So I, I felt happy that I was able to cause some little bit of change in that class. So, but not everyone here in this class is going to take that class. Like it's not on everybody's track. So I'm going to try and stay away from most of what they'll cover in this, but uh, it's, <laughs> the course layout looks like it's all online, and like you just do like these reading assignments and, and like online engagements. So a little bit different outline. All right, so, <laughs> and there is actually money in this, right? If you're money motivated, totally cool. There are people giving out money to do research in this area, right? Because like data science is new, therefore the rules and guidance governing, uh, covering the subject have not been well established. So in that vein, the National Science Foundation put out a half million dollars, which is not a bad chunk of change, right, to do research in this area in 2017, right? And that's an active grant until 2022. So my suspicion is that there'll be other grants like this. So if you're into this area, there is opportunity to do work in research. So that's cool. All right, I'm gonna, so before you fall asleep, because if this is any class that you'll fall asleep in, this might be the one, I wanna get you like the, the big takeaways, right? This is one of the most uh, emotionally significant ones to me because this came from a guy who was like spending 10 years in jail for multiple felonies and he told me this story. I'm just like, holy crap, not that I'm gonna be in jail, but this is a nice life experience to have, right? Like when you're in a, in a, in a very high emotion situation where there's a lot of intensity, you're likely going to make poor decisions. And the way around that is to think about various scenarios that may happen in your future so that when you get to that situation, you're like, oh, I know what to do here because I've already thought about it. Because right? when you're in that, that stressful experience where like, you've got your boss asking you for things and you've got uh, coworkers depending on you, right? maybe you've got a family mortgage and a couple kids on the way, right? like, all these things sort of causing you stress, you're less likely to sit there and be like, huh, I wonder what the right decision is. Right? Like, you're going to be stressed out and you have to respond quickly. So it's worth thinking about how to respond in various situations before they arise. All right, so. Uh, as I mentioned before, everyone has different opinions on what the right thing to do is. And so if you're working in any size organization, you'll typically run into conflict. Even if it's just like a one person company, you're gonna have customers and therefore you and your customers may disagree. But more likely in a large organization, there'll be some policy covering a thing, right? And uh, enforcement of that can be sort of sketchy, right? So like, you have to know that the policy exists. There has to be a policy in the first place. There has to be some enforcement to that policy. Right? So you have to sort of like build a consensus with your peers, the people who you're working with. All right. And then <laughs> this one to me is almost as scarce, right? All of you will leave here and have some responsibility for some data set, right? Someone's going to and you, their corporate jewels, right? And you'll be responsible for extracting value from that, right? Knowledge from the data. That means you have to protect the data. So you will be probably setting policy because you'll know the most about handling the data and what to do with it. And you'll be the most technically competent person in the organization, which means <laughs> that people will turn to you for your wisdom. Good luck. <laughs> All right. And then I'm not a legal, I'm not a, uh, sorry, I'm not a lawyer, so this is not legal advice, but uh, not knowing what the laws are that govern the area that you're working in does not mean that you can get away with whatever you want. Right? This is like, I didn't know there was a speed limit. Well, you still have to obey the speed limit. Right? <laughs> has anyone ever run into that with the law, right? Like just driving down at 35, 40 miles an hour in the residential? No? Okay, it's just me. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. So in your life, there are already this this whole issue is not just because you're a data scientist. This is you as a person in the electronic realm, right? Like you walk down the street, your data is collected by closed circuit television cameras, right? There are web clicks. Like every time you go to a website, you get that little pop up about the, about the cookies, right? All those things. There are there are lots of lots of things collecting data about you, and sometimes there are policies and laws governing that. Um, but often you as the person having the data collected on don't get a say in how that data gets used. Right, so that means that there's a wider sort of societal issue of you have to understand how is the data being used, how is it being misused, where is it being lost, right, all these issues 
this is like a very generic issue outside of data science. So it's, we're going to talk about more of the data science realm, but it definitely applies in your real life and, and to everyone else who's not a data scientist. So my suspicion is <laughs> because other people say, oh, you went through a master's degree in, at UMBC in data science, right? What is your knowledge from this, right? They're gonna, you're probably going to get questions because of your now expertise in data science. Exciting. <laughs> All right, so this is one that will be covered in the engineering management course, so I'm not going to spend too much time on it. Um, who here has not heard of the Cambridge Analytica Facebook scandal? No? Okay, so we'll touch on it a little bit. So basically, there was this Facebook company who has a bunch of data, and then there's this company called Cambridge Analytica. Cambridge Analytica writes an app on Facebook. People install that app. That app goes and gathers all the person's information and all their friends' information, right? And then, so that, that's like, that was, uh, I think, allowed by Facebook policy a while back, and then it changed that you couldn't do that as an app, right? So, but the app developer basically scraped in all the data off of both the people who downloaded their app and the people who were friends with that person. So that's a lot, a lot of uh, people. And so what they did with that is then they sold that data to another organization for political gain. Right? Like if you wanted to know who is going to vote, what where they're going to vote, all this information downloaded from Facebook and harvested through the app was then sold to a you know inform the the, the voting spend for, for political ads. Does that make sense? That's like the short story. And then Congress gets involved because they're like, well, that wasn't very good, right? And so Mark Zuckerberg, who's the CEO of Facebook goes to Congress and says, we're not doing anything bad. We'll try and fix ourselves, right? Don't, don't legislate us. That was the main takeaway. And so this was like, I think three years old when it was first reported, but then it only recently in the past year or so sort of got the, the major attention. So the, the point there is um, typically the way large companies operate is they'll do something and then try to avoid legislation. Right? Because that constrains how much flexibility they have in making profit. And so the, the commercial companies are incentivized in that sense to protect the data and um, make sure it doesn't leak out and make sure it doesn't get misused. But they're also motivated to make money off of it. And those two often come in conflict, right? Of like, how do we make money off this and only uh, do the right thing? That, that, that's a little bit of a conflict there. Yeah. So that's I think a really quick short example of like the moral conflict that arises by having different objectives, right? <laughs> Doing the right thing, making money, those don't always align perfectly. All right. So again, back to the I think data scraping is like the greatest area because there's very rarely um, explicit consent given by the people who are providing the data, right? The individual users or the content authors are typically not saying, yes, please give my data to the entire world, right? There, there's usually some sort of implicit assumption about the data being somewhat protected. And so an example of this is if you've been on a dating website, sometimes you might put things on a dating website that you don't literally want the entire world to know, right? That's sort of a, an implicit assumption of being a little bit vulnerable with the data that I share with the assumption that not everyone will see it. That's the user's perspective. And the company who is hosting that data has the assumption we're going to aggregate everybody's data together, right? protect it, hopefully a little bit, but still be able to make connections. Right? That's the whole point of a dating website. So you have to be able to merge all these different data sets and run across it. So another user might say, I want all the data from the company for very pr various purposes. They'll go off and they'll say, visit all the profiles, grab all the data, right? and then post that. <laughs> so, so this is from 2016, this is relatively recent. So some researchers released 70,000 users from OkCupid. I will not ask who here has used OkCupid, right? That's probably a little bit too private. Um, sorry? What is it? So OkCupid is an online website where you can post a profile describing who you are and who you are interested in. And then OkCupid will take the time to match you with people who you are seeking. 
Yes. Yeah. Right. I'll try and make them more explicit. <laughs> so OkCupid is a dating website where you can find people who you like and like you, hopefully. So the, the point there is that you might post on that website something that you wouldn't tell everyone, your friends and family, and the entire internet, right? Because maybe they don't want to know what you're looking for. Okay. Right. So as I said already, like you so in that example where we have the, the users who are creating content, we have the company who is aggregating all that data, and then we have the malicious, I would argue, users who are sort of like stealing the content from the company, right, for their own purposes. So as a data scientist, hopefully your role is in the company to aggregate, analyze, and protect that data. Yes? Okay. So that's typically where I see you. Oh, oh boy. I just wonder if I... Um, uh oh. <laughs> I think I will not be able to do this exercise because I did not print off the prompt. No, I'm sad. <laughs> no, that's not a yay. <laughs> All right. Well, with my sincerest apologies, I'll tell you what the game was, and then my Matt will be very happy. <laughs> uh, hopefully it's in here. Probably this one. All right, so this was going to be the game, which we'll skip over, and then we'll take a break. <laughs> All right, so so basically the, the game that was going to happen, that we'll take a break after this description, was that one of, it, you would pair up basically in a partners, and somewhat similar to previous games, one of you has the motive to share data, and the other has the motive to not share data. And then you would debate, and there's not a right answer about whether to share this specific data or not, but it's a pretty typical argument for people to have in a company. <laughs> All right, so we will take a break and come back at 8 o'clock. <laughs> do you, what kind of charger do you need, Mac? Yeah. You can use mine. You don't have that? I do. But, yeah, I have, I have this. this. No, that's I'm like, not. I'm out of charging, and um, I love network. All right. <laughs> See, if you're old and poor like the rest of us, it wouldn't be a problem. I'm sorry. No, I think it works well from a common network, but then I left it without the network. No, 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 no. So, um, you, nope. <laughs> you know, we could actually send you the data and notebook separately, right, on platform. So, so I, I did not know that. Emily told me that, but I guess you can submit both the, data, okay. the notebook and the data separately. Yeah, so. So. Okay, so it's not like you want us to. You don't have to zip it. Zip, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, you got my email. I was so I have not processed all of today's oh, okay. email yet. I will get to the email. Yeah. Yeah. Happy Yeah. Whatever. Um. So this code does. If I put the file here, and then it will just. However, I was not able to do multiple files in here. Okay. So, I mean. So why not? How can I do it? Like, I tried How to, did you do it here? Right, you passed in the file name. Uh, yeah, but I tried so, to put like multiple files there, but it doesn't. So what if do. instead of calling this main, or you said like this is the file parser function and then okay. pass in the file name as the argument to the function. So that, there's no need for a main function, but let's re let's rename that to be a file parser. Okay. Sorry. Put it here. 
Question? Yes, of course. Okay. So, um, like here it says, like, you know, the pair wise uh, numerical variables. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, um, like, does it apply to? You have yeah. no. <laughs> yeah, no, I do, but I mean, that, I mean, it doesn't make sense to, like, so, like, violation code and yes. fine, like, you know, it's going to be a one on one relationship. So, like, is there? Violation code, say it's speed camera. Yeah. And fine. Okay. So, should I, should I make it? Are there only values of 32 and only values of 40 here? Uh, like, there are different things, but I mean, like, I, they shouldn't be linearly, linearly correlated. Is that your argument? Yeah, I mean, do you have any other numerical variables? There, but the balance between. The, I don't know what balance is. Like remaining balance of. Okay, so unpaid fine. Yeah, so like I mean. Are there any non-zero values here? Uh, yes, there are. Okay, so I. So I showed the like histogram and stuff, but mm -hmm. like, you know, do I, do I have to do like pairwise comparison? So I th is that in the rubric? I think I think it is there. Yeah, there is, but yeah. I don't know like that's. Just to make it. So if you so in Seaborn, there's a pair plot function. I've seen it, but yes. I mean, I didn't see. I mean, I tried it, but I didn't see anything useful. Okay. Came that's, out of it. That's fine. You can include non-useful kinds, and there's just no, there was no pairwise numerical correlations that were useful here. That's a conclusion. Okay. So okay. Right. Wait. I prepared. Do you want to be here? <laughs> <laughs> well, you're it's certainly willing to like paste the rubric in there. The intention that I was describing, and it was just a suggestion, yeah. is that you should like take this line and say, where is this line satisfied in the code? Where is this line satisfied? Right? Should I do that? No. No, you don't. You <laughs> okay. don't it's not a requirement. Right? Okay. It's just, and, the, and the purpose is because for the midterm, I noticed some students were like confused because they missed some things. Yes. And this is a way of making sure you didn't miss anything. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. No, I just, I just okay. want to know what Listen. Is. Okay. Oh, OK. Yeah, so um, we talked about showing the categorical data. Yeah. So I Perfect. did this, but I also told it to yep. look for yep. it. That's fine. Right? That's right. Yeah. And then, yeah, so, and then you said testing. I just did, I just used one set of data to generate a pattern first. OK. And then I said, oh, let's try it on the rest of them, see sure. if we get something mm -hmm. similar, So, okay. which we did. Yes. And okay. So I did this from what I learned in class, and for fun, mm -hmm. I did a polynomial of your order five. Okay. And then, but there's six of them. It looks like it's only four. So I just played around with it and did like the order linear, and then two, three, four, five, six. <laughs> so you actually have. Six. This is my standard complaint for machine learning: is that like you don't know what's going on, so you just throw everything at it, and then one of them sticks, and you're just like, well, that must be it. But this is to show. <laughs> this is to show that they're actually separate. I'm or do you, do you? I actually explained it. So. But you should rely on this more. That's more. Okay. That because they held constant in that. Uh, but it still still shows. It looks good. And then okay. secondary observation. Mm -hmm. And then yeah, some double function. Okay. So, good. Okay. And then I timed it so. so the whole notebook. Yeah. Nice. Okay. Sounds good. Okay. So, but uh, yeah, I email that here, but I'll submit it too. But Thanks. could you give me some feedback for presentation also? Okay. Yeah. yeah, I think you have a lot of content to cover. So yeah, I guess I think so. Emily and Phil are going to go tonight for Zoom, yeah, right. and so you'll might be able to gauge off like how much content they had versus how yeah. much time it took. So yeah, so I may or may not do it on a PDF because it's just because it's so long. Mm -hmm. okay. Yep. Okay. Sounds good. So you said two thousand rows for data set. If you're using two data sets and one for others, the supplementary data. It's in 2,000 rows. That's what you're doing. Absolutely. The other one's at 49. It's like 67,000 rows. Yes, that's totally fine. Okay. And the point there is having enough data to actually be a challenge first, mm -hmm. rather than just like having 10 rows and like, oh, you got yeah. my data. Yeah. And I just have a stupid question. Okay, so go ahead. <laughs> How do I order these from data to Sort your histogram? Yeah. Uh, can you email that to me as a question? Because it's not a thing that can answer like that, but it is possible. Yeah, it is possible. I know, I know it's possible. <laughs> okay. It's just so, like, I just think. And you have Googled it? I have Googled it, but okay. I just don't think I've Googled it. Okay. Just, just send me a, you can either wait after class and we can talk, or you can do it via email. So oh, wait. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. 
So since we're skipping the activity, we'll have a little bit more time tonight. All right. All right. So the the meta lesson, hopefully that um, you would have been imparted here, is that you're going to run into conflict. And as far as I can tell, the most frequent and common response to conflict is to ignore it, right? Because by ignoring it, you have this implicit hope that it will go away and not be your problem. That's, that's typically what people respond to conflict with. Right? So running into the danger is not normally how people respond. All right, so you can sort of see whether other people are also responding that, to that situation the way you are to see if like, are you normal? Right? And, and maybe you wanna have some curiosity, right? That's one of the things I picked up from Jared is like having curiosity, right? Not making the assumption that I'm right and this person's wrong is a really useful sort of response to, to figure out what is this other person thinking? How do they arrive at that logic? Do they think their way into that or they just fall into that accidentally? All right. So again, back to the small company, big company dichotomy. In a, in a large company, there are often policies that govern how you handle data. But in small companies where you're the only data scientist, then you'll be responsible for also knowing how to protect your data and coming up with that. So there's lots of things to worry about, and I think they're going to be outside of the scope for this class. But if you need a starter point, um, you can come talk to me. I have a little bit of experience here, but um, it's more a question of like who is attacking you and what are you protecting from and up to what standard. Because you can go off crazy land and paranoia of like how you want to protect your data. You have to figure like how much investment am I going to make in protecting my data. All right. So, so if you've visited the internet recently, you may have noticed this new thing of having to accept a cookie on every website that you go to, which is a little annoying sometimes. And so that's because Europe enacted a law, right? But we're not in Europe. <laughs> but the internet doesn't know that, right? And so you, to be super safe, they basically just implement it for everyone who comes to their website. So this is a great example how a locally implemented law affects everyone else. So another cool example of that is that most of the startup companies and large organizations that have a base in California right, are impacted by California's laws. Again, we're not in California. What do we care? Right? Yeah, Alistair? Yeah, um, do you use a VPN when the GDPR sometimes applies? So does that apply yes. to GPN, like if it's in Europe and I couldn't access the um, wall? <laughs> <laughs> Just because they are not compliant. Yeah, so, so there are definitely, uh, if, so it, there are some websites that don't care where you're from, but some websites are trying to figure out, like, yeah. it's all screwy, so. All right, so there are, basically the point there is there are laws that are location specific and there are laws that are domain specific. And so it depends on what field you're working in to figure out what laws are applicable to you. All right, <laughs> so this is uh, basically a story here of warning you of how you think you're doing the right thing can go wrong. So typically when you're working with a very large data set, there'll be some personally identifiable information in there. And so if you want to play with other people, you try and protect the personal identifying information and basically like scrub it out right, to make sure that your data is less sensitive to people's privacy. Right? And so like you'd remove names, birth dates, addresses, zip codes, and right? those are the things that make an individual person identifiable. And so if you remove those out, you think, well, We've removed everything that would identify an individual person, so now the data set is less sensitive. Right? And, and the danger there is that sometimes that's not the case. So whether it means like blurring faces or taking out individual row columns of your data, um, you have to be super careful because other people are not restricted to just using that data set. Right? They can combine the data set that you've anonymized with other data sets and then figure out who is in the set. Makes sense. So, so other people will merge the data sets that do have sensitive information with yours, which has been anonymized, and de-anonymize it. So the quick example here, um, I'll let you read this, and then we'll summarize what happened there. 
little bit of reading. It's on your Blackboard if you want to share your screen now. <laughs> so the fast readers are finished. Uh, basically, healthcare data, they wanted to share it. So they removed everything that they thought was personally identifiable, which is very reasonable. Right? The thing that they weren't counting on was a researcher who said, I happen to know that I can buy the voter registration. Right? And then they went off and merged those two data sets for a mere $20, um, and then deduced where the governor you know, was in that original data set. And then they sent that back to the governor and said, hey, uh, we just called up your, your, your system here. So this is this researcher is somewhat famous for this story, but they went off and did it again later. Basically, they showed that with a small number of fields, every single human in the United States is identifiable. Right? Like You don't need that much, that much uh, information to make every person unique. So this is sort of a word of warning. I don't have a question on that. You probably haven't run into this previously, and it's somewhat unlikely that you will run into it in the future, but it's good to know that this issue will arise if you run into this, this, this uh, data anonymization issue. All right. <laughs> so how many here of you have a medical record that you think has been sold by the health insurance company that you are using? Everybody raises their hand. <laughs> Right, so like, if you're setting on a treasure trove of highly useful and expensive to collect data, you should sell it. Right, that makes you money. <laughs> Everyone here agrees with that? Oh, you don't. <laughs> right, so I'm a I'm a hospital. I have thousands of hundreds, tens of thousands of patient records. Right, which drug companies would love to get their hands on. Right, because you know, as a drug company, I need to have some basic data sets that have medical information. So the hospitals and the drug companies, they're like, drug company has money, hospital has patient records. The hospital anonymizes your data and then sells it to every company. And that's how hospitals make money. You all agreed to that when you signed up, right? <laughs> cool. All right. We're good. So, <laughs> but this, so this, this is just a story right, about your hospital records. Right? This, this applies to just about every company that collects your data. So that's something we're thinking about because like people get reasonably paranoid in this domain of like it's really hard to not have your data submitted to every commercial company and then sell it to everybody. Kind of sucks. All right. So now we'll get into a little bit more data sciencey domains where you actually have some influence. All right. So this is like again super normal as a data scientist, the company that you're working for wants to make money. That's why they're a company usually. Not all companies, but most companies. Um, and so they'll be looking to you to make sort of new knowledge that can be exploited to gain profit. And so um, their moral stances on getting there aren't always the best. All right, so I'm not going to pull this up. But, oop, oop, oop. All right, so there was, and, and I don't know if you guys have covered this already in machine learning course, but again, a little bit of story here. So. The company Target, which if you're not familiar with Car Target, they sell like homewares and clothes and other so, like necessities. So they have, what is Target to you? Dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> right, you spend money there. All right, so Target is a company that sells things. And so they recognized that um, in certain sort of buying patterns, you could deduce the future outcomes for individual purchasers, right? So like. If a person is buying certain items, maybe they're going to have a baby in a few months. And it turns out that Target has sufficient amount of data that they could figure out which trimester the pregnancy was in from the purchasing. <laughs> and if you don't know what a trimester is, that means women are pregnant for nine months. They divide it up into three, right? That's trimesters. 
<laughs> Sorry, like, we're in a data science class. So, <laughs> so Target had the ability to make a prediction based on buying habits to figure out which of its customers were pregnant and in which trimester they were in. And this is useful, right? As a company, it means you can better spend your marketing revenue to target people who you know are going to need certain things in the future. So you'd send out, say, coupons for diapers in the correct, you know, the third trimester where you start stocking up on those things. Right? <laughs> That's cool. So as the parent of a teenager, if you start receiving diaper ads saying like, congratulations on your upcoming pregnancy, <laughs> you're like, That's bad, right? <laughs> Yes? All right. So I, don't, I haven't been a peening pregnant person myself, but I can imagine that that wouldn't be the best scenario to be in. And that happened. Right? <laughs> Target used their data. They predicted an outcome. They started advertising. And then some people got in trouble because their parents weren't sort of bought into the story that they were pregnant. So that was a little bit of a PR issue for public relations for Target. All right, another story, which I won't pull up here, but um, this is a link. Basically, there are companies who AI, artificial intelligence, it's very hot, right? Like, it's a big field. And so, as a small company, just starting out, maybe you haven't invented your artificial intelligence algorithm yet. So, what do you do? Right, you hire people to do the work. Yes, this is, <laughs> so, <laughs> We can take a vote on this one. Who here thinks that it is reasonable to sell a product as artificial intelligence, but it's actually being done by people? <laughs> Nobody? Really? Nobody's biting on that? Because that's totally, it's, it's a bootstrapping method, right? Like, I don't have the machine intelligence, the machine learning algorithm to do my task yet. And so while I'm getting people onboarded and like bought into the idea and investors, I'll have people do it. Right? And then once we've aggregated enough data and labeled it and then done our machine learning homework, right now we have a machine learning product. So there is an actual, like, it's called a cold start problem. You have to start from somewhere. So this is a reasonable thing that people do, but companies are often not explicit about where that boundary is, right? <laughs> what part of it is being done by humans and where is our actual machine learning software being used? So this causes some problems when your investors are spending large amounts of money Right, and a company that doesn't actually have any AI product. Yeah. Okay. So when you go off, you like you're like machine learning. Like is the hotness, right? You're gonna have to solve the problem of how to get started from not having any labeled data and not having any mathematics to support your algorithm. So you will use humans. So it's a question of how how clear you're on that. Mechanical Turk, by the way, that's who here has used Mechanical Turk. Who has heard of it? Okay, a couple of people. So Mechanical Turk, this is an, I think it's from Amazon, right? It's an Amazon service. So, yeah, yeah. So, so there's two things there. There's a Amazon service and there's the historical story. So the, the, sto the origin story of Mechanical Turk is that someone built a robot back in like 1600s, I think, around the Enlightenment. So 1600s, um, someone built a robot that plays chess and it beats people. Like, that's pretty amazing, right? A robot that plays chess and beats human players, that's amazing. How did that work? <laughs> well, there was a person under the table moving the machine, right, playing the chess. <laughs> so this is called Mechanical Turk. So the modern version of this, this is like an actual product you can buy on Amazon. You have like a task that takes like five minutes or something, and, and it pays the person who's doing the work like, 10 cents for some like small amount, right? And so you can farm out uh, a very small um, task with a high number of instances to a bunch of humans. So this is an Amazon sort of product that matches people with work with people who want work, but very small amounts of work. So the idea there is that your artificial intelligence task could be just a bunch of people in the background moving the letters, right? Because that's a question of like, where do you, have an honest conversation with the people who are throwing money at you. So if you have money being thrown at you, awesome. I think I salute you. All right. So now we're going to have a little bit of a conversation in pairs. Whatever the one. Ha, 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 ha.
right? Starting around. If there is another extended activity, this is, I will start with one over here and then we'll work with that. <laughs> Have you ever worked with a coworker going on? <laughs> what did you do with it? <clears throat> Have you Yeah. 
So we'll take like one more minute and then round up as a group and see what the collective knowledge is.
escalate is more like harsh. Oh, you know, it becomes so unofficial. Because... <laughs> Guys, yeah. everything for how do you handle underperforming people? A lot of it. So training, maybe. Okay. Sure. So maybe investigate a little bit. for people interacting with different objectives? Bill, Canning? Um, I was thinking probably need to um, discuss with them like how they come to like their their reason behind what they want to try to find the Making the what? So finding a, a shared goal. Okay. Probably just start from there and build up to, um, you know, an understanding. Okay. Maybe you both like the same sort of sub at subway. Um, yeah, but like, <laughs> maybe more, more work related. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's see. In the back, how do we deal with people who are maybe a lower moral standard? In the back. Uh, I guess you, you know, so you don't start from the standpoint of like holding the bow. Sure. Right? Oh. Um, there's again the situational, right? Um, <coughs> if you know someone could be very uncomfortable with what you're doing, but you're not breaking the policies and rules, yeah, um, the laws. So that's kind of a gray area there. So, but then the, I think the question you phrase this is in a competition setting. So uh, we talked about that you know, in, in an environment like that, we'll, you know, we'll do our best and you know, within our comfort zone, but also work the system to the degree that we can get competitive without breaking the rules. Don't don't sort of meet them at their yeah like, right right right. Stay above board. Yeah. Don't cheat. Anybody else have any last thoughts, yeah, Emily? Well, I was going to say, like, if you, even if you um, are competing with these people who have, like, fewer moral constraints or maybe then more out of it, like, you're offering something to your group as people who trust you. So maybe uh -huh. find some way to communicate with them. So show you your value. Right? That's good. So then they may get a solution faster or more efficiently, but you're getting it the right way and, and you have to advertise that. Last comments? Yeah. Okay. Some music going on in the background there. All right. Yeah, so we can uh, rejoin back to your seats. Yeah. All right. Got a little bit left. So, I think I'll talk. I'll, I'll just talk about these because um, we're just about towards the end of what I've got here. The 
this slide was basically like understanding like what is your product deliver right so if you're in the banking industry or the hospitality um like what is it that your product offers and that's something worth contemplating before you take a job offer so like when i sign up for my work role i understand the moral hazards of it and so figuring out like if you're working for a self-driving car company right are you okay with your product the code that you write possibly killing someone because that's a realistic outcome right Maybe if you work for the insurance company, maybe you end up, your, your insurance company uses your code and ends up not paying someone who lost their house in a fire, right? Are you okay with that outcome? So it's recognizing the sort of moral hazard of your work role is important because it's likely as a data scientist, you'll be sort of operating at the core of a company's competency, which means you have wide ranging effects on the outcomes. So even if only a few people get hurt, off of, you know, out of 100,000 customers, are you okay with that? That's, that's a reasonable question to ask. All right. Um, and then, yes, shoot. What's the likelihood of getting um, in your team such a So I, I think, so I don't have a specific answer, but I'll sort of like riff on it a little bit. So but the likelihood of you having control <laughs> over like, you know, does my self-driving car kill 10 people or 100 people, right? That's typically not the question that's posed. Yeah. So, uh, so um, I was working for a small company, mm -hmm. and the changes to the code that I made, you know, um, whenever I say the code was you know, going a lot, but now I'm working for a big company. Every code, like, you know, this, like, you know, line gets two days to be worked in. It has to be approved by five people. Yep. So, you know, and a decision of that scale has to go from multiple stakeholders. That's right. And so there's a diffusion of responsibility there. Yeah. So, I mean, what is the real chance of getting into the dilemma? So, this, this is something I'm not a philosopher, but I'm aware of this philosophical yeah. base. No, I'm, not, I'm not asking again. I'm not trying to make it, you know. Possible, like, you know, but like, what I mean, what is our take, like, you know, in real life? Like, you know, uh, I don't try to explain myself. So I'm going to pose this story, and you tell me whether this story is relevant to the point you're trying to make. Yeah. So I go off and I kill somebody, right? Clearly, I'm 100% responsible. Yes. Yes. And so now let's say, you know, I contribute some code along with 40 other people, which ends up accidentally killing one of a thousand people. Did I kill a small portion of that person? Am I responsible in some way for their death, right? And like, if I increase this through five layers of approval in a 10,000 person organization, it ends up killing one in a million people, am I still responsible for that outcome, right? That's a reasonable, is that the question you're asking? No. Uh, no. Okay. I think what he's saying is, what are the odds that one of them killing us? Yeah, certainly, um, in the short term, we'll be involved in such a theory. 100%. I am involved in those decisions. So you're the only person, right? <laughs> Who else here is going to be working in a data science field? All right. Who do you think you'll be offered? You'll be involved in this sort of question. As, as of those of you who think you'll be operating in the data science regime. Well, I'm not in the data science field, but I work for that particular company. Benefits for everything. Absolutely. Anyone else? Who, what other fields are people going into? That's to say, Rachel? I think the point is not that, like, the point is you aren't going to, like, be explicitly making this decision. Like, you're not going to decide, am I going to kill this person or this right. person? You have to be aware of the fact that your actions cause a chain of reaction that could result yes. in a death. And are you okay with that? Yeah, I understand, uh, but like for instance, like um, I have a friend who is working in medical industry, and like one of his friends searched for uh, he had access to like uh, medical history of you know and the entire country, and this idiot searched for Michelle Obama. Sure, that's totally not. And the next day, ask you know Tim, and then you know, he lost job, he lost job, and he lost everything. Yeah. So I mean, there are multiple like you no. Know, of you know, uh, like I know, 
um, not security, but you know, um, approval. Yeah, approval, but um, checkers or like um, checks and balances, checks, checks and balances. Like you know, um, I don't feel like you know I'm gonna be affecting anything big or uh, it's like a dilemma. So you're so isolated in some sense by the bureaucracy that you're protected from any of those problems. Is that everything? Well, even if I want to make such a change, even if I wanted to, that's not going to happen. <laughs> like, okay. Like, not bad. <laughs> <laughs> like, so I, I, I hear what you there, there are mechanisms in place that would yes. prevent you from being stupid. Yes, exactly. But then how did your friend get in trouble? There weren't mechanisms? I want to get in trouble. Yeah. So my claim to you is, because you're a data scientist, my claim is that you are more likely to have the power and technical capacity to inadvertently, or like intentionally or accidentally, cause harm. I don't, I don't know specifically whether your position will enable that, but I'm claiming in general that's more likely for a data scientist person. Because you will be exposed to large amounts of data, Many data, different data sets, right? You have, you'll be asked to merge all these different data sets, right? That's what I'm merging. What you're saying is, the data science is, you will have less restriction. Typically, the data yes. Data, the data that you're playing with. Typically, yes. So, so like a, a normal sort of like database, and you know, administrator, the person maintaining the database has the authority to do whatever they want because they're the administrator. So that's, that's a very similar role to a data scientist, where you will have authority overseeing all of the things, being able to do arbitrary transformations on the data, and therefore you get to do what you want, which is great and powerful, but also highly risky and potentially harmful. So, yeah. Not all physicians will necessarily have that freedom, but my claim is that most of people working in data science do get exposed to that risk. How many rows would you say that is? Of okay. patients? Yes. Millions and millions of patients. <laughs> and there's what, 350 million people in the United States? So. Yeah, all the like records, like the um, medical records. Yeah. So, I don't know like, how many patients we have full, but we have a lot of patients from Arabia and some other like, countries, like all of your data from the hospital. Sure. Well, I, I had a like, full access to the database, and there's more. <coughs> Databases are monitored and sometimes they're not. So you hope that in that case that database is. Assuming that the, yes, logs get generated, but logs don't necessarily get stored or analyzed. Yeah, yeah, they, 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 someone analyzes, someone analyzes those logs will find out what you should. <laughs> and they want to think that when you search on Google, that it doesn't get reported. For sure. You know. All right. So we're gonna so we're gonna do a little bit of exercise, and then we'll take another break because it's not eight forty-five. All right. Any, any last quite, any last points besides that on that last discussion? Everybody's happy. All right. So the last activity before we jump off at the end of the big break is what is your advice for new students? So there's some paper. Hand out more paper. If people need it. Uh, so this act. 
the main you'll be turning in the focus, but depending on whether you feel comfortable. Yes, I do. Uh, there's paper up here if needed. I'll come back with pens. Okay, so I will be collecting your response to this activity. So please write legibly. What is your question? 13. <laughs> no, 14. 14. <laughs> <laughs> You'll need to be more explicit because I'm going to rearrange next semester. So. When you've completed your documentation, then you can turn it in up here at the front and go on break. Come back at eight. Be back. Perfect.